Good morning. Thanks for joining me for another of our Unfolding the Word studies. We've been studying in 1 Peter for a while. Today I want to pick up our reading in chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We've been looking in this portion of the first chapter of First Peter at the issue of our salvation and the wonder of our salvation, the foundations of our salvation, and the awe that should be ours as we reflect on all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. The purpose of the review of the wonder of salvation in this portion of 1 Peter is partially to encourage us to grow. What do I mean by that? Well, reviewing salvation, while that can help somebody come to know Christ, find salvation, primarily 1 Peter is reviewing the wonder of salvation to help us understand that it's but the beginning of God's great purpose and plan in our lives. God's intention in my life and God's intention in your life is that we would mature as redeemed children of God. This process of maturity is central to an understanding of the Christian life. We're not saved by maturing, <laughs> but God's purpose is that we would be maturing if we are saved. Now, over the last couple of days, we've looked at verse 13, the preceding verse, which talked to us about the fact that growing, moving forward to grow once being saved, is stimulated and directed, beginning-wise anyway, by focusing our thoughts, preparing our minds for action. We talked about the, that picture, word picture, of girding up the loins of our thinking and the centrality of the scriptures in creating that proper mindset. Now today, he moves to yet another part of the growth process. As we focus in on the word, getting our minds disciplined and focused and tucked in, God says there's another thing that we're supposed to be doing. And this has to do with our will, not just our mind. God says, I want you to set your will on holiness. Let your will join with your mind and accomplish some movement forward in the spiritual growth process. Now, what does it mean, set your will? Well, to set our will has to do with our volitional choices. It has to do with the choosing aspects of our life. Not just the thinking, but the choosing. And uh, while where one stops and the other begins is an unclear line, there's still a distinction, isn't there? between what we are thinking about, reflecting on, and the choices that we are making, both attitudinally and behaviorally. God says, I want you to choose behaviorally and attitudinally <laughs> behaviors that, pro that produce and lead to a holy life. God says, we are to make choices. Now, let me quickly add here, because I feel there's so much distorted and wrong teaching about this. Understand that in this portion of 1 Peter, God is not saying, I want you to choose to be holy so that you can be saved. Brothers and sisters, no one has ever been saved by trying to be holy because we're sinners. <laughs> None of us is holy. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have chosen to go their own way. That's the reason Christ came into the world to die for us. No, we can't be holy enough to be saved. And God is not calling for us to be holy in order to be saved. That's why the gospel's already been reviewed. But let me also say the challenge to choose to live a holy life is not so that we stay saved. No, uh, we stay saved because of God's great promise of protection over us once we have repented and believed in the gospel. No, so get out of our mind the idea of the challenge to holy living is having anything to do with being saved or staying saved. So then what does it have to do with? Well, good question. 
the choice of holiness, the choice of growing in, in our holy living is having to do with what it means and how we begin to develop as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must make choices attitudinally and behaviorally to target a holy life. Now listen, whenever the scripture challenges us volitionally, challenges us at the will level, God is in a sense saying to us, listen, I'm not going to make the choice on your behalf. <laughs> Even if you're my redeemed child because you've repented and believed in the gospel, I won't make choices for you. You must still be active in making a choice to live in a way pleasing to me, to live in a way that pursues after holiness and holy living. God won't make the choice for us. And no matter how much you may pray for God to make the choice for you, he's not going to do it. You have to make the choice. You have to determine, attitudinally and behaviorally, that you're going to pursue after a holy life. Now, once we make such a choice, then God's great promise to us is that I will give you strength and enablement to carry out the choice. The strength and enablement from God doesn't allow us to make a choice or cause us to make a choice. It enables us to carry the choice out. I was thinking of how Colossians 1.29 helps us to understand this cooperative relationship. Paul says there, For this I toil, struggling with all of his energy, that he so powerfully works within me. Do you see the cooperative nature? Paul it was making a choice to move in a direction, to toil and to labor and to serve. And then God was enabling and empowering that choice as he sought to move forward, a cooperative venture. But brothers and sisters, if we enter into this or think we're going to enter into it by asking God to make the choices he says we must make, we will get nowhere. If we make the choice that God says that we're supposed to make, then he promises to enable us through his spirit to carry through that choice. So it's his power that carries out the choice. It is our volition that makes the choice. You follow the point here? An important one for us. Well, let's summarize again. God says, listen, I want you to obey my command to be holy. This is a choice of the will. It's a proof that you're going to be an obedient child to me. As obedient children, make this choice. We are all children of God because of our response to the gospel. If we've received Jesus Christ as Savior, we have been made children of God, adopted into his family. And as his children, God doesn't force obedience. It's a choice on our part. However, God wants obedience in our life. And because he's a loving Heavenly Father, he will discipline us if we're not obedient to doing the things that he wants us to do. Hebrews 12 develops that at much more length for us. But he says, listen, the very fact that I'm disciplining you to try to build you and grow you and help you to become even more obedient is a product that shows that I love you. I wouldn't show you that I loved you if I just let you go and develop in random sorts of ways. Think about the natural family. A child has to choose to obey, or they can also choose at times to disobey. And in a good family, the parents will enforce obedience and discipline disobedience. That's true in the spiritual family of God as well. As God's children, God is calling for us to choose an obedient life. He make, says, make the choice. But understand the choice you make brings consequences, positive or negative. It, like in the natural home, if you choose not to be an obedient child, it should bring consequences of discipline in your life. In the spiritual realm, in the family of God, as a child of God, if you're choosing not to pursue holiness, not to grow as a disciple, you're being a disobedient child, and that will bring with it God's discipline in your life to help you learn what it is to obey him and to please him with your life. Obedience, lack of it. Are you an obedient child today, redeemed, and choosing to do that which God says to do? Understand, a life of holiness, a life lived in a holy way, is God's great intention for you as his child. 
It's been true in God's plan of things since the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve at the very beginning. It will continue to be true all the way until Christ returns. He wants his redeemed children to be obedient, to make choices, to live in a holy way. All right, is it clear? <laughs> Well, then the practical question becomes, if that's right, and I want to be an obedient child, what does it mean to be holy? What is it that I'm going to make will choices about? And it is to that question that we will turn in our next study tomorrow, Lord willing, as this passage helps to clarify for us really what a holy choice is all about. Join me then, won't you? God bless. <music>